infinite limits are when f of x, the function itself, or we often think of that as y, or we also think about that as the dependent variable, when those go to plus or minus infinity. Limits at infinity, however, it's when x, or the independent variable, goes to plus or minus infinity. We can extend this to talk about how infinite limits, we were thinking about vertical asymptotes. Limits at infinity, we're going to instead be talking about horizontal asymptotes. There's also slant and oblique asymptotes, but I'm not going to be going into that very much. Let's look at an example we reviewed when we were talking about infinite limits, and that is y equals tangent of x. We rewrote tangent of x as sine x over cosine x, and looking at the limit of x approaching pi over 2, both from the left and the right hand side of tangent of x, we rewrote that as the limit of sine as x approaches pi over 2 and the limit of cosine as x approaches pi over 2. And that was based on the quotient property for limits. And we found that that went to positive and negative infinity. Therefore, there was a vertical asymptote at x equals pi over 2. We can expand that to say that really there are vertical asymptotes anywhere x equals k times pi over 2, where k is an integer. Looking at inverse tangent, I don't see any place on this graph where the limit goes to infinity. However, if instead we want to look at what happens as the independent variable goes to infinity, let's see what we can tell about this graph. As x gets larger and larger, it looks like my inverse tangent, and let me label the graph, it looks like the inverse tangent gets really close to this number that's about 1.5. Well, if I remember anything about my inverse tangent function, I remember that the domain of inverse tangent is negative infinity to positive infinity, but its output, its range, only goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. I think this is a lot easier to see if I change my uh, markings on my graph for the x going just integer values and my y-axis stepping in terms of pi. So it looks like as my x gets larger and larger, that is my input variable gets larger and larger, my output approaches this asymptote at y equals pi over 2. So this is no longer a vertical asymptote that we're talking about. We're now talking about horizontal asymptotes. And I can write this as y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2 are horizontal asymptotes. But how do we come up with this while we're talking about limits? So we can say in general, if I have a function f of x and it becomes arbitrarily close to a finite number l as x gets sufficiently large, that's a little bit vague, but I'll just say as it approaches infinity, then I can say the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals l, and y equals l is a horizontal asymptote. I can expand this to x approaching negative infinity as well. If x gets sufficiently small approaching negative infinity, then we write the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals l. Let's look at these two examples. We're going to still be using those limit laws that we came up with before. Let's look at the first one. The first thing I'm going to do is using the sum limit law. In fact, let me be very specific with what limit laws I'm using. I can use a polynomial limit law that says if I just plug in x equals infinity into that, I get the limit. Well, 16 is always 16 no matter what. And if I look at the second one and use the rational function limit law, now I can't let x equal infinity, certainly not infinity squared, but I do know that the limit of that rational function as x gets larger and larger and larger, well, that's just going to go to zero. So that means the limit of the first example is simply 16. For the second example, I did the same sum limit law. I also used the constant multiple law to pull that 2 out. Now that sine x over square root of x, I'm going to have to use the squeeze theorem for that. The squeeze theorem, I need to have a lower limit and an upper limit that sandwiches my function I'm trying to find the limit of. Well, I know the largest value that sine can be is 1, and the lowest value that sine x could be is negative 1. So I know negative 1 over the square root of x is less than or equal to sine of x over square root of x, which is less than or equal to 1 over square root of x. So now all I have to do is look at the limits of those outside edges, and I'll get what the limit of the inside is. 
the left hand limit, the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 1 over square root of x. Well, that's just equal to 0, again, by the rational function limit law. And the same thing with the upper limit. So since sine x over square root of x is in between those two values, that means the limit of that sine x over the square root of x is simply also equal to 0. Therefore, my final answer for this is simply 3. So if I take my two examples, I can say in both cases that both have a single horizontal asymptote. The first example has a horizontal asymptote of, of y equals 16, and the second has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 3. So for this equation, it certainly looks like the horizontal asymptote is y equals 16. Again, we have a vertical asymptote here, so if the question asked you for both horizontal and vertical asymptotes, we'd have a little more work to do. And here's a graph of the second example. Notice in this case, the function actually does cross the horizontal asymptote. But as we had this go for x going towards infinity, it would settle out to the value y equals 3. Now, it doesn't always work out that there is a finite limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity. This is, on the left, y equals x to the 6. And to be honest, anything to x to an even power would look something like this. As x approaches infinity, my x to the 6 function also goes to infinity. When I let x go to negative infinity, however, this x to the 6, it actually still goes to positive infinity. If I look at my second graph, I see a slightly different response. When x approaches infinity of x to the 7th, it's still going towards infinity. However, when x goes to negative infinity, the limit is x approaches negative infinity of x to the 7th, that equals negative infinity. I'm going to start off with the following assumptions before I talk about some laws of infinite powers and polynomials. I'm going to assume that n is a positive integer and that p of x is a polynomial. It equals a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1, all the way down to a1x plus a0. And I'm going to assume that an, that first coefficient, is non-zero. These first two laws are what I just talked about, the limit of x to the n power as n goes to infinity, both positive and negative infinity, that's equal to infinity if n is even. However, if n is odd, it goes to positive infinity when x goes to positive infinity, and it goes to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. We've used this one, the limit as x goes to either positive or negative infinity of 1 over x to the n, which of course can be rewritten as x to the negative n power, that's equal to 0. This one, however, is new and really helpful. It says if I have a crazy polynomial, really the only thing I care about is the first term of the polynomial. So the limit of a polynomial px is simply equal to the limit, as x approaches plus or minus infinity, of that first term, a n x to the n. It'll either go to positive or negative infinity, depending on two things. First of all, either n is even or odd, and the sign of a n. Let's look at an example of this. Let's say I had this crazy polynomial that I'm trying to find the limit of. I can use that last limit rule. It doesn't matter what's going on here. I'm only focusing on the very first term of the polynomial. That is the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative x to the fifth power. I'm going to first pull that negative sign out because I don't want to get confused about that. So negative times the limit of x approaching negative infinity of x to the fifth. Five is an odd number, and if I have the limit as x approaches negative infinity, that means that's equal to negative infinity. And negative negative infinity is positive infinity. All of this can help us answer a question. The question is, describe the end behavior of rational functions. All that means is look at what happens to these rational functions as x goes to positive and negative infinity. Well, that's nothing more than the limits at infinity that we've been talking about. So let's look at these three examples. Notice the first one has a numerator and a denominator where the numerator exponent is 1 and the denominator exponent is 2. That is, this is called bottom heavy. The exponent in the denominator is larger than the exponent in the numerator. The second example has the same exponent in the numerator and denominator. That is, the highest exponent in both cases is x to the fifth. The third example has the numerator with a greater exponent, 
and this is called top heavy. Let's look at our first example. Notice what I did is I've already used the quotient rule for limits. If I went ahead at this point and plugged in infinity for x, I would get infinity over infinity squared. I can't evaluate infinity divided by infinity. You remember that when we talked about, let me go back to that, when we talked about sine x over square root of x, if I had plugged in infinity for those, well, sine of infinity, that really doesn't have a value, and we'll talk more about that, but then the denominator would be infinity. So we cannot evaluate things that are infinity over infinity or zero over zero. Notice when I was talking about 2 over x squared, that was 2 over infinity. That, we could say, does approach 0. But we don't know what to do when I have infinity over infinity. That's called indeterminate form. So what can I do to this? Well, I know that I can handle 1 over x or 1 over x squared. So let's take the largest exponent of x. In this case, it's x squared. I'm going to divide the numerator and denominator both by 1 over x squared. Once I do that, I get the following. So now if I use my sum limit law again, after simplifying, I get the following. When I have this like this, I see my numerator is still going to be equal to 0. However, my denominator is not all 0. In fact, it's equal to 16. This is because each of these terms go to 0. With all of those going to 0, I end up with 0 over 16, which is equal to 0. So the end behavior of f of x as x goes to positive infinity is 0. And I think you can see that if I let x go to negative infinity, those still go to 0, and we're still left with 0 over 16, which is 0. Let's look at our second example. Oops, before I go on to the next example, I do want to explicitly say that there is a horizontal asymptote for my first equation at y equals 0. I'm going to use the same trick as I did last time. I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by 1 over x to the fifth, because x to the fifth is the highest exponent. Once I let the limit go to infinity for x, I see that most of the terms again go to 0. And whether I'm talking about positive or negative infinity, the limit is equal to 4 divided by 2, or 2. And again, I'm going to have an asymptote at y equals 2. So we've talked about when the denominator has a higher exponent, that's bottom heavy. We've talked about what happens when they're equal in the numerator and denominator. And lastly, we have top heavy. So top heavy is when we can end up with what's called slant and oblique asymptotes. I am not going to worry about that. I'm not going to be asking questions about that on exams or homework. But we're going to just focus on what the end behavior is for top-heavy functions. If I do the same trick as before, I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by 1 over x cubed. And when I do that, I get the following. I get 12 over 2x squared plus 4 over x cubed. If I let the limit as x approaches 0, this works out to be 12 divided by 0. This is not an indeterminate form. This is a number divided by 0, and that means this is infinite, specifically towards positive infinity. Again, what we have to worry about is if I have 0 divided by 0 or infinity divided by infinity. But if I have 12 over 0 or 0 over 12, I can actually evaluate that. This video is already longer than I want it to be, but let's go over quickly four special functions, e to the x, e to the negative x, natural log of x, and cosine of x, or you could also say tangent, or sine, as well as the reciprocal functions. If you know what the graph of e to the x looks like, then it wouldn't be a surprise that the limit of e to the x as x goes to infinity is simply infinity. However, the limit of e to the x as x goes to negative infinity, that is equal to zero. Again, if you know how to graph e to the x, this shouldn't be surprising. You're going to get the exact opposite with e to the negative x. That's because it's 1 over e to the x. So as x goes to positive infinity, e to the negative x goes to 0. And as x goes to negative infinity, e to the negative x goes to infinity. Natural log of x, remember that's just the inverse function of e to the x. It doesn't look like this goes to infinity, but believe it or not, the limit as natural log of x goes to infinity it gets there slower than everything else, but it eventually gets to infinity. The limit of natural log of x as x goes to negative infinity, well, that's a little weird because it never can actually get past 0. In fact, it never gets past 0 approaching it from the right-hand side. So the limit of natural log of x as x approaches 0 from the right-hand side, that's equal to negative infinity. 
And finally, cosine, sine, tangent, none of those ever settle to a particular value. So in that case, these simply do not exist. So the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity for our trig functions, they do not exist.